To understand my story, you sort of have to know a tiny bit about trespassing laws in our country, and that we don't have any so long as you're respectful and non-destructive. You can walk over any hills you like and, in my case, camp on any beach of your choosing so long as once you leave the area, it's how you found it. I used to love camping when I was little. Our family would go multiple times a year with a large group of my parents, friends, and their kids. On average, there were maybe ten of us at a time, which was a bit of a logistical challenge since we always headed out to this one really remote beach on the coast. Actually, we weren't the only ones. There's always yachts bobbing just off the shore with people in them and other campers lining up and down the beach. Most of them also had children or teenagers, so it wasn't a wild party scene. It was very much an informal family holiday spot. There was even a small building with toilets and showers installed nearby, even though this was in the middle of nowhere. I guess the local council must have figured it out and got sick of people peeing behind bushes. We took a trip up in spring of 2011. I'm really bad with time, but I know this because I got my dog in winter of 2010 after picking her out that November from the shelter as a birthday gift from me to me as I paid for her adoption fee. Now I know you all love dogs, and she will be very important to the story later on, so let me tell you a little bit about Parmesan. Parmesan came to me as a six-month-old puppy who had been rescued from a dogfighting situation. We're not entirely sure what breed she is exactly, but... My best guess is a lurcher staffy mix. She is a wonderfully well-tempered dog with people and most dogs, but you absolutely do not threaten her. She'll have you. So by the time of this camping trip, I had Parmesan for a few months. She'd never come camping with us before, but as far as my family was concerned, dogs go on camping trips. So when we all piled into the car, she came too. Unusually though, none of the family friends could make it, so... It was only me, my sister, my dad, and my mom. I didn't mind. I wasn't that attached to the other kids. I'd rather play with my dog, and I'd still have my sister. The drive took the best part of six hours, and because we'd left a bit later, although I don't remember why we'd left later than normal, we arrived at sunset. Not a good time to be building a tent, but we'd expected to arrive to other campers already set up and the beach illuminated in campfires. But the beach was empty. In spite of this, my parents started taking stuff out and trying to build the tent. They asked us to fetch some of the lighter bags from the boot of the car while they sat pointing a flashlight at the sand to see properly. I rolled down the window of the car for Parmesan before getting out. It was pretty hot for that time of the year and I wanted her to have air. Always gotta be looking out for my furry little homie. As we're fumbling about in the dark on a beach in the middle of nowhere, it's pretty spooky. The one road that led to this beach was circular and had a bridge over the water, meaning you could basically circle around the bridge like a big zero shape if you felt like it. I wasn't really paying any attention to the road. I was complaining I was tired, as kids do, but my mom was. After maybe 15 minutes of my dad trying to nail the tent into the sand, my mom asks him, had he seen that car driving around? It's been a few times. My dad kind of shrugged her off. He sort of liked that. I don't know if he said anything back to her, but after a few more minutes, a car pulled up next to ours on the road and someone got out. It was maybe 15 or 20 feet from the cars to where we were, and the light was pretty low, except for the torches. We weren't expecting to see anyone else here at this point, and I think my mom said it must be the security. I don't know why a random beach would have security. I think what she meant was the Wildlife Trust or something, as they do occasionally come down to do their nosy work. The guy was walking pretty unevenly. He must have been drunk or high because he had that stagger to him. There was absolutely no way this guy was sober. Great, I thought. A junkie. Not an unusual find, but it's rare to see them in the wild. As he walked into flashlight range, we realized he was carrying a large knife. Maybe 15 inches. Although I was small at the time, so maybe my sense of scale was off. I don't like my dad, but credit to him, once he saw this, he got up immediately, holding on to the camping mallet and put us all behind him. The man began to shout wildly at us that we can't camp here and he was just letting us know. My dad tried to initially be a bit low-key with the guy and told him that was fine, we'd leave, but 
This didn't work. He kept coming closer to us, so my dad started shouting and the man kept shouting back. My sister and I were crying. I remember shaking. I was utterly terrified as I'm sure anyone would be in that situation. It really did seem like this guy and my dad were going to fight and I'm going to be honest, I didn't fancy my dad's chances. While it's grim to consider, I'm absolutely convinced he would have killed my dad and possibly us as well once he was done as I don't think my mother would have had the common sense to run with us. I love her but she always put dad and her relationship with him above us. This isn't how it went down. A bolt from the black like a wolf descended upon its prey and took us all by surprise, but most of all, the man with the knife. In that moment, Parmesan was the apex predator. She got him good by the arm and clamped down hard, ripping his jacket and shredding the skin underneath. He dropped the knife as it had been in the arm she had got him by. He kicked her, he punched her and eventually got her off. He grabbed the knife from the sand and ran back to his car and drove off. Parmesan didn't follow him. She stayed with us, muzzle covered in blood. Quickly as we could, we gathered our things and all got back into the car, all pretty shook up by the incident. I looked Parmi over and she was okay, but the car's windows were much more open than I'd left it. We think what happened was when the shouting started, she must have put her paws on the gap that I'd left for her. As it was an old car and had the rolly down windows and on an electronic button, we think she must have been able to hit it with her paws and force it down enough to squeeze out. But this isn't the end of the story. We were all pretty scared and since we had the dog with us, we couldn't book into a hotel for the night. My parents decided just to drive home so we could all feel safe but first had to drive into the nearest town for petrol as they were kind of low. I spent the time trying to clean Parmesan up a little. I'd always loved dogs, but what she'd just done for me really blew my mind. As we drove into town, we came across a petrol station, but it looked closed. My dad drove up closer to get a better look and stuck his head out the window to get a better look at the sign. My mom asked him what on earth he was doing, and he told her he was trying to see when it opens. Never. My heart sank. Parked in the corner behind a van, so we hadn't seen him at first was the same man with the knife. He was sitting on the hood of his car, using some tissue paper to clean up his arm. It looked pretty bad. Without stopping to refuel or look anywhere else in town, my dad just drove right out of there. We decided to go to the next town over, but that was impossible as the next town over apparently was 60 miles away. It didn't have that much petrol and we realized as we began driving, we were probably going to break down. That's fine, Dad said. We had AAA coverage and they'd come tow us home or at least somewhere acceptable for the night, better than staying in the last town. After driving for maybe five minutes, lights flashed us from behind. Another car. The same car the man had been driving. It was him. He was following us. And he must have realized that we were low on petrol. The next half hour was one of the worst half hours of my life. I had a complete and utter breakdown, as did everyone else really. I could tell my parents were trying to keep it under wraps so it wouldn't upset us, but we weren't really little kids, we were both double digits, we knew how dangerous the situation could be. Dad turned off the radio to pay attention and the man followed us for 55 miles before he peeled away onto another road. Our fuel meter was on the big red E for empty for the last 10 miles we were basically driving on fumes. I don't really believe in God, but if he does exist, that was definitely one of his miracles. And once we got there, we drove into a petrol station and refilled to a full tank before driving the rest of the way home. My sister and I slept in the car after that. I only woke up once and we made it all the way home, just grateful nothing worse had happened than that. After getting some sleep, my mom phoned the non-emergency line for the police and reported what had happened. They never got back to her after that, but apparently the woman she spoke to said they may wish to in the future as he matched the description given of a suspect wanted in relation to an actual murder charge. No idea if he actually was the guy or just some random psycho. As I said, they never got back to her. So what's the takeaway then? Other than crazy man on the beach... 
let's not meet obviously. Well for me, it's that I love Parmesan. She's still with us now, old as the hills and twice as grizzled as one of my mom's friends likes to joke. I don't know why she did what she did that day. I couldn't tell you what her thought process was. What I do know is that this poor puppy was born into an environment where they abused and neglected her, only to be rescued and taken to a shelter where her mother and siblings all found homes before her. Despite how badly people had treated her, when I took her home she forgave but never forgot. I think the saying is I never trust a person who doesn't like a dog but I always trust a dog when they don't like a person. They have a very good understanding of human body language and I think she must have understood how much danger we were truly in. If you're able to, please adopt. You'll find yourself in a situation like mine one day. I promise you if you're willing to save a four-legged friend's life, they will pay you back tenfold if they're able to, without a thought for their own safety. I paid 78 quid for Parmesan's adoption fee, which is a lot when you're a kid, but it chills me to my bones knowing if I hadn't been so insistent on a dog, I might be dead. Back when I was attending a university, I used to work on campus at one of the dining halls during the dinner and night shift. I lived in the next town over since it was cheaper to live in a terrible little apartment out of town than to live on campus in the dorms, but I didn't own a car so I had to take the bus. One night I had just gotten off a shift at work. My feet were killing me and I was completely exhausted as I slowly made my way to the bus stop. I noticed a man much older than me sitting on one of the two benches at the otherwise empty bus stop, but I didn't pay too much attention to him. I simply sat down on the second bench and listened to some music while waiting for the bus to arrive. The first sign that things were starting to get weird was when I kept noticing out of the corner of my eye that he was staring at me. At first I thought I might be imagining it, so I looked over and caught him quickly turning his head to look away. Okay, so he was staring at me. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary since being a young college girl seemed to gain a bit of attention from older men. So like usual, I just ignored him, and that was a mistake. Again, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him look at me, but instead of just staring this time, he got up and walked over to sit next to me instead. I continued listening to my music, hoping that he'd see the earbuds and take the hint that I wasn't interested in having a conversation. Instead, this man literally took the earbud out of my ear. Hey there, sweetheart, he said as my head snapped to look at him in shock. I should have told him off for touching my things and demanded he leave me alone, but I was sort of frozen and didn't want to make him mad. Oh, hi. I replied quietly. He started introducing himself as Mike and telling me that he lived in the area and it was always nice to see pretty girls like me at the university bus stop. He explained that he was a real man, unlike the boys I went to school with, and that I should go home with him that night. I was shy, scared, and I never had a man as bold as this in my face. I say to my face because I had certainly gotten my fair share of unsolicited private pictures online by that point, but I digress. I didn't know how to respond, so I didn't. But that didn't stop Mike from continuing to explain to me all of the fun things he wanted to do with me at his place that night. He went into graphic detail. The things he described started out with basic things you'd expect and escalated to him asking if I liked being choked until I turned purple and passed out in bed. I wish there were anyone else at that bus stop, but it was just the two of us, in the dark, as I counted the seconds until the bus would arrive. Then Mike took things to a different level of shocking by telling me, Listen, the demons want me to ask for your phone number, and they say you should give it to me, or you won't like what happens. He actually had the audacity to start stroking my hair. His hand was gentle, but... I didn't want him touching me at all. This was shocking for a number of reasons. The demons? I wouldn't like what would happen? Why was he touching me? What was this guy talking about? As though he could read my mind, Mike went on to explain. 
My therapist knows the demons are real. I told her about them, and she says I'm not crazy and the demons are real. He laughed then abruptly stopped. Now give me your number like they said. He demanded, and as his hand stroked my hair for the last time, he stopped and gripped the back of my neck, still gentle but even more terrifying. I was scared and obviously didn't want him to have my phone number, but he was taking out his phone and I knew he was going to call the number I gave him to make sure I wasn't lying to him, and he still had his hand on the back of my neck, so I reluctantly gave him my real phone number. Stupid, I know. But I was right and he immediately called to check. All I could think about was just not making this guy angry long enough to get away from him then block his number. Thankfully, the bus came moments later. I sat down as close to the front of the bus near the bus driver as I possibly could since the bus was basically empty. Mike decided to sit directly across from me. At this point, I had tried listening to music again, hoping that being on the bus and him having my phone number would signal to him the end of our conversation. However, he decided to reach over and unzip my sweatshirt, revealing my work shirt and the name tag which I had unfortunately forgotten to remove in my haste to leave work that night. I hadn't told him my name yet. Abigail. What a beautiful name. Our daughter will be named Celeste. I shouldn't have been shocked at this point, but I was. I stopped listening to music again and zipped my sweatshirt back up, which made him laugh. You won't need that soon, anyway, he said and winked at me, implying how he planned to undress me even further that night. At one stop, Mike tried to convince me to get off the bus with him. I told him no, that I was tired and just wanted to go home, so he said okay and stayed on the bus. I knew that it had been a stop, so the fact that he was staying on the bus worried me. I was sure this meant that he was planning on coming home with me instead. Baby, Mike whispered to me. I tried to ignore him, but he repeated himself louder. Baby. He had the most unsettling smile on his face as I asked, What? He laughed and told me, The demons say you smell nice. I was terrified and I felt like I was going to throw up by the time that my bus stop arrived. I lived in an apartment alone and didn't want him to know where I lived. Despite my body being exhausted and sore from work, adrenaline kicked in and I bolted off the bus and ran straight home. I made it inside and locked the door. I looked through the people and didn't see him, so I went to carefully peek out of the window and saw him standing near the bus stop looking around. He took out his phone and sure enough, I started getting a call from an unknown number since I hadn't saved his number. I ignored it. When he hung up, I started getting several texts asking where I'd gone, how he didn't like hide-and-seek, and how the demons just wanted to have fun, but I was being a little baby about it. I was so scared because he knew which apartment building I lived in, where I worked, where I went to school, my phone number, and my name. The only thing which made me feel slightly relieved was that he didn't know which specific apartment I lived in, and that's when he started yelling outside. There was no specific word said, just wordless yells of what I can only assume were frustration and anger. I blocked his number and kept all the lights in my apartment off as I cried with my back to the front door. Maybe I should have called the police, but my brain was so frazzled that I didn't even think of that until the next day and by then all I knew about him was that he was a mentally unstable man, probably named Mike, who hadn't actually done any physical harm to me so I didn't think it was worth it. In hindsight, I know that I made a lot of stupid mistakes during this experience. I ended up moving away entirely at the end of that term of school for unrelated reasons, but until then I switched to day shifts at work and was paranoid every night. Thankfully, I never saw that deranged man again. This happened quite a while ago when I was home alone with just my dog. After all this time, I'm sure what happened was really strange and I have no idea what this man actually wanted. I was watching television one night at about 11pm when I heard a car pull up outside and the engine shut off. I figured it was obviously a neighbor, but 
Nosy Dog wanted to have a look and went to the window. He's kind of messed the blinds up when he went to look, so I got up to fix them. When I did, I noticed a car parked on the street across from my house and my neighbor's house. I couldn't really make out any details, but it looked like the driver was still sitting in the car. I didn't really think anything of it. I got a drink and went back to watching TV. Quite a while had passed since I fixed the blinds, but I'm not sure how long. I'd guess maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Out of nowhere, I thought I heard tapping at the door. Not a knock. It was much lighter and very quiet. My dog had to sit up to look at the door and I paused the TV when the same tapping then started on the window. I opened the blinds a little and saw a man standing there. I couldn't make out his face properly and he immediately walked back to the door and started tapping at it again. This doesn't sound very frightening and I'm not sure why but I suddenly had a really awful feeling. I felt absolutely terrified and I had no idea why. The tapping at the door never stopped but Something in my head was saying if I opened the door to him, then something really bad would happen. I went upstairs to open the window to ask what he wanted. It felt safer after doing this. He said in a really quiet voice he was delivering pizza and told me how much it cost. I felt so stupid for being frightened and told him I didn't order pizza. I guess he was speaking quietly and knocking lightly so he didn't disturb my neighbors. My dog had followed me upstairs and was letting out the odd growl and bark, which isn't really unusual for him. I was trying to shush him when the man downstairs told me he had the correct address and I better get downstairs now and open the door to pay what I owed and collect my food before it got cold. I was really confused because I most definitely didn't order any food and began telling him that again when I noticed he didn't even have a pizza. He wasn't carrying anything at all. I told him again that he had the wrong address and he started getting really angry. He kept demanding that I open the door. He was going between angry and sort of trying to persuade me to go back downstairs. I asked him where the pizza was. He said he had a hold of it. It was really dark but he definitely didn't have anything in his hands. My dog was really making quite a bit of a fuss at this point and the stranger had turned into a broken record. Come downstairs open the door, come downstairs and open the door. All the noise must have alerted my neighbor who did open his front door, and the man didn't say a word, but practically ran across the street to the car that I had heard pulled up a while ago. He went back to the car empty-handed. I had no idea what he wanted, but he certainly wasn't a delivery driver. It really freaked me out as well that my dog is quite obviously a large breed, and the man saw him through the window and he wasn't deterred at all. It seemed even stranger and less random that he actually drove to my house as though he'd planned on showing up. Let me start off by letting you know that I was living close to a metropolitan area for a little over a year before moving back to my tiny 10,000 in population hometown. Before that, I was at college, other places, etc., and didn't interact with anyone from my hometown besides family for many years. I even deactivated Facebook for a few years. Anyway, fast forward to fall of 2020, I moved into a house in the tiny town. One chilly fall night, I decided it was the perfect night to chill and get inebriated off of my many glasses of wine. I was relaxing on the couch with my girlfriend when we suddenly heard someone knock on the front door. It was around midnight, so she immediately told me not to answer the door. I immediately got up to pull up the blinds on the glass portion of the door to see a meek-looking girl, probably younger than 20, standing on our porch with a blanket and bag. I was shook by this because in a town like this in the Midwest, there literally are no homeless people or because the town is so small, people usually have a support network when things go sour. I asked her what was going on, and she said she was homeless and needed a place to stay. My drunk self thought this would be an amazing time to fulfill my need of helping the world by opening my front door to let her stay in the guest bedroom. My girlfriend immediately sat her down and was asking her questions, and her answers were pretty vague, thinking back. 
Eventually, she told us she knocked on every door down the street to find a place to stay because she got into a fight with her mom. So, she wasn't homeless. It is also odd to think a young girl would do that considering the danger. Eventually, I find out that she went to the same private school that I went to from 1st to 6th grade, except the college extension of the same campus. We were kind of bonding on talking trash on the campus because it's this new age nonsense school run by boomers, but then she mentioned that she had a no contact order for sitting at the same table as someone at the school. My drunk self didn't register what no contact meant or restraining order, so we're talking and she says that she recognizes me from Facebook. I was alarmed, especially because I have never seen this girl before in my life and we have an almost 10 year age gap. She told me it was because I posted a local rental on the Facebook home share. It was for my mom, who was a realtor without Facebook. Okay, that's reasonable, small town. But then she tells me that she knows my mom. This is alarming because my mom and I have different last names, and she doesn't have social media or any way to connect us. Another thing my drunk self registered only the next morning. Fast forward to the morning, she says she's going to leave and I ask her if she wants a ride home because it's cold out. As I drive down the street several miles, I realize she does live on the same street, which she also would have had to have passed at least five developments and many rows of houses to get to my house. Was I really the only one to answer the door or did she target my house? The next day my girlfriend and I both discussed how odd that was and how many things didn't add up. Later in the day, we come back from the store and we see the girl in front of our house again. I'm panicking because I'm horrible with confrontation and my girl said, you let her into our house, you deal with it. She stays in the car and asks the girl what's going on and she asks again if she can stay with us. I panicked and asked her to come out of the car and my girlfriend told her that she didn't know if she had a gun or who she was and she could only stay with us if she opened up to us about everything and why she's not going home. We sat her down in the kitchen and nicely grilled her, only to get vague answers. To be honest, initially I was concerned it was an abuse situation, but it turns out it wasn't. At this point, she's in our house and we don't know how to get her out. By a stroke of good luck, she says she's leaving to go to the dining hall and will come back later. We quickly tapped signs on both the front and back doors that read, Landlord won't allow additional tenants. Best to go back to your mom's. It's later in the evening and dark out at this point and we hear banging on the front door. Then we hear banging on the side door, then the back door. Finally it stops and we're upstairs and we knew it was her, so we just waited it out about an hour. I walked downstairs to check because we're starving and wanted to use the kitchen. I decided to take literally one finger and slide one blind shade up from another to peek through the kitchen glass doors. And she's standing there facing me in the pitch black on my back deck. After an hour, I looked her dead in the eye and then turned around and went upstairs. Time passed and she eventually left. When I opened the door, we noticed she took the handwritten notes. As the next day rolls by, everyone's mom and cousin is lecturing and laughing at me about opening my door to a stranger, which, to be honest, I would never do normally but the whole thing wasn't sitting well with me and I needed more information. I posted something on Facebook about it and a boy I went to elementary school with messaged me and asked me if it was insert name here because she had an obsession with him that led to a restraining order. He advised me that she's probably harmless and not to respond to her. She hasn't come back since and I still have no clue why she truly showed up or how she knew me. It cost me the purchase of a ring security system, but I suppose it could have gone worse. I never thought about sharing my experiences, but since a few people were interested in my last post, I thought I'd share one that still haunts me to this day. It happened last year in October. I was 19 years old and I live in the UK, so around this time of year it gets pretty dark early. I finished college at 3pm and decided to make worth of my college gym membership, so I headed over to the other college building where the gym is and 
spent about an hour there, so by the time I got out, it was dark. As I left the building, a man approached me, around six foot, 45 years old, with dark hair with bits of white going through it, and this is how the conversation went. Do you go to this college? Yes. Do you know my daughter, Samantha? Uh, no, there are four college buildings. I don't know everyone. Well, she's lost. I called her and I can't find her. Um, well, you can go to reception and give her a full name and they should be able to tell you where her timetable is and what time she left or something. Can you help me look for her? N no, sorry. It'll only take ten minutes. I don't know this area. Can you show me where girls like you usually go? Uh, no, sorry, I have to go. Just go to the reception. It's right there. Okay. At this point, I knew something was very wrong, and I knew I shouldn't have interacted with him, but sometimes people are truly genuine. Anyway, I started walking down the one-way street, which, I might add, only had one lamppost to light it, and I used my phone's reflection to look behind me and see this man was nearly running at me. So I started voice recording and sent a voice note to my boyfriend, but acting as if though I was on the phone with him as well. And I did this until I was around other people and ran over to my bus stop where I felt a bit safer since other people were there. I put my phone back in my pocket and turned around, seeing the same man staring right at me, and if looks could kill, I'd be six feet under. I turned back around and put my back to the wall so this way he couldn't go behind me and I could watch his every move, and he just kept walking past me. I had missed four of my buses at this point because I knew he was trying to see what bus I was getting on, and in the end, he walked off out of sight, and as soon as he did... My bus came, thankfully, and all I could do but run on and call my mom. My mom was obviously furious and told me she would meet me at the bus stop with a knife in case he had followed me, but thank God for me he didn't, and thank God for him he didn't because he would have either ended up in the hospital or dead with the way my mom is with her blades. Ever since, I've been really anxious going to that college and back since I still go to the same place. I no longer go to that gym and... Thankfully, the building he'd seen me exit from wasn't my own, but he did see my bus stop, and since then, I always have my earphones on really low, in case I ever hear someone walking behind me. I am a single mother to an obnoxiously adorable seven-year-old boy. This happened when he was five years old in the summer of 2018, and the what-ifs still haunt me. There is a beautiful park on the river that my son and I used to frequent. On the summer evening, we decided to picnic in the park for dinner. When we arrived, there were lots of families playing with their children on the playground. We found a spot in the grass near the water, laid down on our big purple blanket, and began to eat. I was facing the playground, just people watching, when... I noticed a group of three children that seemed to be alone. There were two boys and one girl, and they looked to be between the ages of nine and twelve. You know that bad feeling you get when something just doesn't feel right? These kids gave me that feeling almost instantly. I brushed it off because, well, they were only kids. My son and I were almost done eating and ready to play when some dark clouds came rolling in. We live in Florida, and this is standard for a summer evening, so... I decided to wait it out and see if it would pass, and it did. Everyone cleared the park with the exception of the group of children that I mentioned before. It was at this point that I realized that they were definitely alone. I figured they must live nearby. I took my son on the swing and these kids were just sort of hanging around near us and staring but not saying anything. Then the youngest looking boy came up to my son on the swing and stood in front of it so that my son almost hit him while he was swinging. He just stood there. I asked him what he was doing and he didn't answer. It made me super uneasy so I took my son off the swing and over to the jungle gym on the other side of the playground. My son and I were playing on the other side of the park and I didn't see the other kids anymore so I thought they must have left. I sat down on a bench near the jungle gym and watched my son as he played. About ten minutes later I looked over toward the parking lot and noticed the same group of kids were actually 
still at the park and were over there talking to an older man with a dog. This went on for another five or so minutes and then the man and the children parted ways. The man walked down the street in the opposite direction. The children came back to the park and over to the jungle gym where my son was playing. I was still sitting on the bench, which was probably about ten feet away from the jungle gym, when those kids started hanging around and talking to my son. They were asking him lots of questions like, how old are you, and where do you go to school? He was answering while climbing around and didn't seem to be paying a whole lot of attention. I was watching the other kids the entire time this was going on because they just gave me an unwavering bad feeling. And after a few minutes they got off the jungle gym and began walking toward the road. I was so fixated on the top of their heads as they were walking away that I didn't realize my son, who was tiny, was walking with them. They were almost to the street when I screamed my son's name and he turned around and bolted back to me. I asked him where he was going and he said, they said they had to show me something. We left immediately. I really don't know if it was sinister or not, but I can't explain the kids trying to lead my son out of the park, and I often think about what could have happened if I wasn't paying attention. Was the old man somehow involved? I spoke with my son about following the stranger danger rule with anyone he doesn't know, even if they are kids like him. We don't play at that park anymore. I drive by that park on occasion and I've seen that old man a few times, but I haven't seen those specific children. Years ago when I was a freshman in high school, I was in a foreign language class. The teacher assigned a class project and let kids pick their own partners. There was nobody in the class I was particularly wanting to work with, but I ended up picking the guy in the back of the class, Chris. Chris was about 6 feet tall and 300 pounds and had a horrible stutter, so nobody would ever pick him. I worked with Chris for about 35 minutes on the project and the teacher said, Okay, class is almost over. Exchange cell phone numbers so you can work on the project outside of class because I won't be giving you any more time to work on it in class. So we swapped numbers and Chris turns to me and says, The short girl chose me today, huh? Th th this will be interesting. And walked out of class. I tried to brush this off, but was admittedly a little weirded out by it. So I'm waiting to get picked up after school by a friend and notice that my cell phone has a new voicemail that's just shy of four minutes long. I listen, and it's Chris's mother saying how she's so excited that Chris has a new girlfriend and how we can get married whenever she would take us. Mind the fact that we're both no older than 15 at the time, and I've only talked to this guy about a school project for a period of about half an hour. I was really creeped out by it, but it was a weekend and my teacher had already left school, so I thought I would talk to her on Monday. All weekend, Chris was trying to text me, asking what I was wearing, where I was going, and even if I could come to his house so he could brush my hair when I was sleeping. I had this dude in like three of the classes too, so I felt pretty stuck and I was freaking out. I had told him to stop texting me and not to worry about the project, that I could finish it if he just left me alone. On Monday, I instantly booked it to my teacher's classroom when I arrived at school. The teacher was just walking into her classroom, so I walked up to her and said, Hey, I need to talk to you about my partner. When we both turned on the lights when we entered the classroom, Chris was sitting in a desk waiting for us. He looked at me and said, I won't let another sh short girl get away with this. I turned around and started running down the hallway, and I looked back and he was following me close behind, with the teacher a bit behind screaming at him to stop. He got close enough that he was able to trip me while I was running, resulting in me landing on my arm funny and completely breaking my thumb. He was laughing hysterically and trying to pin me down when the teacher came and pulled him off me, and security pursued shortly after due to the commotion. I went to an urgent care and got my thumb casted and didn't go to school the following day. But when I did come back, Chris wasn't there and it was never discussed again. It still creeps me out to this day.
This night took place a few years ago while my father and I were living in a small rural town in Alberta. I was fairly new in this town and didn't know anybody but my dad and co-workers. I had found a job as a key holder in a liquor store that closed every night at 2 a.m. My store was located in between a pharmacy and a grocery store, a place well lit where I felt safe most nights, not knowing yet that this town was actually known for its drug problems and random creeps. This particular night, my co-worker and I had been working late. We needed to finish unloading pallets of liquor since we had another shipment coming in the next morning. At the end of the night at around 3.30 a.m., I told my co-worker that she could leave and that I was going to take care of closing down the store, which basically meant counting the till and cleaning up, as she was exhausted and that I had the keys of the store anyways. After she left, I quickly finished my tasks, took all of my stuff, and called my father. At the time, I didn't have a car, and my dad would come pick me up every night and bring me back home, which was maybe a 5-10 to ten minutes drive to my workplace. I have an amazing father. In return, I always made sure to be ready and to wait outside of the store for his arrival. I didn't want him to have to wait for me because I knew he didn't have much time left to sleep since he had to work in the morning. I got ready to get out of the store, set out the security system, and locked the door behind me. Now, you have to understand that I wasn't supposed to finish this late at night and that once the alarm system was on, I couldn't go back inside because the regional manager would receive a security call if I had opened the door and the alarm would automatically start to ring and I didn't have the code to shut it since I had never worked a morning shift yet. The store policy mentioned that if you forget something inside, you would have to wait until the next day to get it back. As I was waiting for my dad, standing in front of the store, I heard some noises coming from my left. It sounded like someone was breathing loudly. The pharmacy that was right next to my store had these big red columns in front of the entrance, and I thought the noise was coming from around these columns. I looked to my left but didn't see anything, so I brushed it off thinking that it was probably the wind or just my very tired self imagining stuff. It was almost 4am after all, and I had worked really hard that evening. After a few minutes, I heard the noise again. I started getting nervous. It was definitely coming from my left, and this time, I knew that it was not in my head. At that moment, I noticed a movement and realized that I was not alone. A few meters away on my left, someone was crouched down behind one of the columns. I couldn't see his face, only his hands holding one side of the columns while he was slowly moving his head to look in my direction. I was terrified, completely paralyzed with fear. I knew my father couldn't be very far away from the store at this point, so I grabbed my phone to call him. My dad answered and I told him to hurry up and explain that someone was hiding next to me and that I was petrified. My dad said that he was going as fast as he could and told me to grab my keys and to get inside the store. I was trying to find them inside my bag, but I was panicking too much my hands were shaking, and I couldn't find my keys for the life of me. I felt completely horrified when I realized that the man had stood up, still hiding behind one of the columns, only a few meters away from me. My voice filled with fear. I asked my dad where he was. He shouted that he was almost there. I started to slowly move towards the grocery store that was on my right, never turning my back to him. The very tall and imposing man looked at me again, but this time... He got out of his hiding spot and started to walk in my direction with the biggest smile on his face. I can still recall thinking that this was it. I was going to die. I was trying to decide if I should start running for my life or if I was better to face and fight him if need be, but suddenly I heard a big noise coming from my right. I turned around and saw my dad driving as fast as he possibly could into the parking lot, honking and turning his high beam headlights on. I believe the startled the man. My feet finally decided to move and I ran as fast as I could and jumped inside my dad's pickup. Tears coming out of my eyes, I watched this man looking straight up at us and slowly waving at my father for what felt like an eternity but really was only a few seconds. The creepy man started walking towards us and as he got closer, my father finally got a good look at the man and said, Oh my god, girl, I guess you haven't met Peter yet. I didn't understand. My dad started laughing, tears coming out of his eyes while I looked at him, still in complete shock. To me, there was absolutely nothing funny at that moment. 
A few seconds before, I thought my dad wouldn't get there fast enough and that I was going to be murdered right there in front of my workplace. My father waved back at him and we drove off slowly. On our way home, he explained that Peter was a very nice man with a cognitive disability. He said that Peter lived in town and that every morning he would sit inside the Tim Hortons that was located in the same parking lot as my store and would ask people if they wanted to get a hug. He apparently did it every day and everybody in our small town knew him. My dad told me I should give him a big hug the next time I would get a coffee at Timmy's since I probably scared the poor man to death. Either way, Peter the Hugger. I'm sorry, but let's not meet again. Well, not while I'm alone outside at 4am anyways. This happened nearly 20 years ago, but I will never forget it for the rest of my life. I went to college in a very small town in northwestern Maryland. Our school is set at the foothills of the Catoctin Mountains, and my friends and I would drive around the mountains smoking. We got very comfortable on the roads and knew them very well. The story takes place before we knew the roads when we just got to school. Several of my girlfriends and I went out for a ride at night. The roads are winding and narrow, some parts drop right off the side of the mountain. It was nighttime, so we were taking our time. We didn't see many cars when we would ride around, which was perfect. That night, however, as we pulled out of the parking lot, another car did as well. We didn't think much of it, as we thought it was another student. We enter the back roads and the car is no longer behind us. As we go deeper into the mountains, a car comes up behind us. The car was very close to us and we were getting freaked out, Mind you, we didn't know these roads yet, and they were back roads, unpaved, and nowhere to turn around. I'm trying to drive as quickly as I can in order to get away from this car. All of us are freaking out and are convinced that this person is out here and is going to kill us. Finally, we see a chapel with a parking lot, so we pull in, turn back to the main road, and watch a red-haired man drive past us slowly, staring directly into our souls. We book it down the mountain, park our car, and call public safety to tell them what had happened. A day later, we get an email from campus security telling us to look out for a man with red hair, glasses, and a beard. He had been trying to get into the campus's dorms and was following women around the campus. So I was female, 18 at the time, and going to apply to get my driver's license. I wanted to go to a center a bit out of town so it would be quieter and decided on a place that was a walk and two different train routes away. I could have possibly asked my dad for cab fare, but I don't like asking for things, so. So I had checked on Google Maps beforehand and it seemed really close to where the train stop was. But once I got out, all I saw was a giant road and the area was very industrial. The area was dodgier than I expected and I didn't want to be on my phone. I decided to go up to a small group of women selling fruits since they would know the area and seem like a safe option to ask for directions. At the stall there was a man and he said, I actually work there and I'm on my way and I'll show you. I felt a bit nervous but he seemed confident and friendly. He walked me out of the station and down the road telling me a long story about how he was late for work and he was going to get in so much trouble and about being late before, etc, etc. His story was getting more and more detailed and he started to seem nervous and almost talking too much. Once we had been walking down the road a little, I realized we were walking in the wrong direction. So I asked, where is it from here? And he pointed way ahead of us to a warehouse. I knew the center was definitely not that far away, so I just initially nervously, with him saying again and again it's not far from here, and then eventually assertively said I want to be safe and thank you but I'll just take a cab. So I ducked into the closest business, which happened to be a veterinarian, and I called a cab. When it came, it took me in the completely opposite direction. This was definitely incredibly creepy and I have no idea what his plan was once we got to that warehouse, but I know for certain it couldn't have been good. Hey friends, thanks for listening. 
click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.